I was recently in South Korea, and while walking with friends in a night district, I was confronted with a hashtag MeToo feminist march that was piggybacking on the latest in victimhood trends in the US, and the participants, it would seem, sought as much attention as possible as they chose a Saturday night to exclaim their hatred for the patriarchy and demands for a more feminized Korea. And this got me thinking. This video is kindly sponsored by Vikings. I really enjoy real-time strategy games. Command & Conquer Zero Hour was my absolute favorite when I was young. Like those games, I want to introduce you to a very cool mobile game that resembles those top RTS games of yesteryear, Vikings War of Clans. You can choose your own gameplay style. Are you a diplomat, a builder, a ruthless warrior? The game has amazing graphics and now has 20 million players, which allows for nation-to-nation -nation battles. To support BPS and have a great time, please download Vikings using the links below and get your initial protection shield for free and my special bonus of 200 gold for a fast and successful start. Many would say that the current social paradigm now being enacted in the West rests on the axiom that a feminized society that can and should rid itself of what is generally referred to as toxic masculinity is not only desirable and achievable, but inevitable. However, others feel that with the very recent cultural shift that there is now a continual denigration of the masculine in the public space and it is not only fueled by the noxious cocktail of academia and the media, but is solidified in the oft-heard mantra emanating from the many disparate groups that seek to dismantle all of the cultural institutions of the West, smash the patriarchy. But is patriarchal society this horrible thing that feminists exclaim it to be, or even a necessarily bad thing? Well, it depends on how you look at it, also on whether it matters to you to have a stable society that has the potential for longevity. But in this video, we will examine patriarchy and how it has been a force for social good in human history and how it will make a resurgence in the West one way or another. Defining patriarchy in the most simplistic way possible would be a system where males are expendable, females are to be protected, and children are at the center. More broadly, patriarchy is a system where men hold the primary power in society as well as in family life. Men are mostly in control of the political and economic spheres and they hold the position of leadership within their families. Historically, human civilizations have been created almost exclusively along patriarchal lines for the very simple reason that it works. Conversely, most matriarchal and egalitarian systems were tribal at best. Today, groups that only the most obsessive anthropologist has ever heard of, the Garo, the Bribri, or the Akan, are cited as examples of such systems. Or, feminized societies can also arise coincidentally at the very end of a long and bountiful period in the life cycle of a civilization made strong originally by patriarchal principles, such as we are witnessing today in the modern West. I have spoken on this subject before, and it of course proves to be controversial as well as emotional, mostly to a small subset of women and an even smaller subset of feminized men that see any interaction between the genders as a zero-sum game. This video is not for these people, as what you have to understand is that the professionally offended are fanatics. For them, there can be no nuance, there can be no shades. If men and women are not identical, then as their logic flows, there must be one that is superior and one that is inferior. The entire concept of men and women as they have lived for the past several thousand years in partnership is completely lost to those that cannot see past their rabid ideological baggage. 
What is clear, however, is patriarchal societies encourage men to invest in their families and communities. We know clearly that patriarchal societies are successful as those organized around the principles it espouses, family, fertility, and children, are the societies that have come to dominate our planet. The civilizations that are rooted in Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Confucianism, Judaism are all patriarchal. So too are the religious traditions of Sikhism, Shintoism, and Jainism. Even Buddhism, which is packaged for Western audiences as rational, modern, agnostic, and liberal in matters of gender and sexuality, has at its core systematic patriarchal deference, which is traditionally attributed to the Buddha himself. All of these religious and cultural traditions that have been created and nurture the principles within stress the need for female obedience to her husband and crucially male responsibility to his family. At the basis level, the health of a tribe or society can really be measured by one thing, its position on natalism. Patriarchy is pro-natalism as it is centered around children and promotes human reproduction. Now, any culture that organizes itself around anti-natalism is at very best maladaptive. The principles of child-centered, strong, monogamous, heterosexual families has been the building block of every successful society and civilization. To work in opposition to these values as modern feminism does, is hence not only maladaptive, but any society that fails to reproduce itself will in time shuffle its way into the dustbin of history and be inevitably overtaken by another group that is pronatal. The modern West is a very good example of this. Europe, currently being led itself by a crop of childless leaders, is a place where fertility rates are below replacement level, meaning more people are dying than being born. The solution to this predicament has been to import people from radically different cultures, which just so happen to be more patriarchal, to have the children Western women refuse to have themselves. What it also means is that the children born to these new arrivals will either be absorbed into the host culture and become less fertile themselves, or patriarchy will be reasserted and either people will start having children again or the original society becomes demographically and culturally replaced with people that will. London, Paris, Amsterdam, Brussels, and Berlin are only the beginning. In fact, a very good visual that in my mind encapsulates the values of modern feminism and its anti-natal focus was the display put on in Ireland in late May 2018. And when I say display, I do so as I have no other words to describe the joyous celebration by women as abortion was legalized in that country. The photos and videos show women crying in delight and squealing in ecstasy. And the atmosphere was more akin to one of fangirls at a rock concert than simply acknowledging that despite birth control being legal and readily available, the termination of life can now be had on demand. Now, I do understand that for some Western women to terminate a pregnancy is, in their minds, a key human right, but I'm not speaking on this. Also, I'm not commenting on the ethics or on the ability to have abortions, either right or wrong or what even constitutes a child, as these questions are beyond the scope of this video. However, when I was looking at this sea of people and the glee and happiness on their faces, all that struck me was that for all intents and purposes, this was a frenzied celebration of antinatalism and a frenzied celebration of anti-life. And this in a nation that already has a fertility rate below replacement levels. The current push of those that rail against the historical nature of Western civilization as patriarchal 
advocate for women to abdicate motherhood in favor of career and encourage women to express themselves in sexual ways that mimic men's instinctive reproduction strategies and then hold slut walks to display their pride at being promiscuous, even though studies have suggested that the more sexual partners a woman has, the more difficult it is for her to create stable relationships later in life. Moreover, there are real and concrete reasons why patriarchal societies have attempted to limit and restrict promiscuity. Historically, without a judicial system that favors women in family law with regards to disposable marriages, a welfare state that can act as a surrogate husband and provider, and of course, the now beloved, celebrated, and cherished ability to terminate pregnancies on demand, promiscuous sex could potentially be catastrophic for women. It was the woman that minus a husband and provider that would bear all of the costs of a pregnancy, physically, psychologically, financially, and socially, and none of them to her favor. This is why mate selection was so critical for women and her children's survival. And either way, the currently celebrated emancipation of women from motherhood and matrimony for a life of promiscuity backed up by the courts, funded by the government, and medically assisted via abortion creates a whole host of other problems at the societal level. And to be clear, this does not mean that women or the feminine are to be equated to the values of feminism and antinatalism, but is in fact the value system propounded by those that protest against the gender and sexual constraints placed on a patriarchal society. It's also of note that in the past several decades, many of the women who have embraced feminism have been later in life cratered, disaffected, childless, and alone, owing to their unused wombs. Moreover, since the 1970s, when women were first convinced that career was a better life path than being a mother, well, report after report on the well-being, happiness, and feeling of satisfaction in Europe and North American women has plummeted. Perhaps this is why fewer and fewer women openly identify themselves as feminists. Currently, those pushing for a feminized society mistakenly believe that feminism equates with equality. Moreover, they also mistakenly believe equality means equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity, equality before the law, and equal human rights. The poster zur of the feminist movement is currently Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who, via his luxuriant hair and skills as a former substitute drama teacher, beguiled the female vote and famously stated that his cabinet, which he made gender equal despite the fact that elected female MPs only made up 26% of the House, was needed as it was the current year. And in doing so, he demonstrated that equality of outcome is one of the highest virtues of a feminized society. Patriarchal societies have been successful for a host of reasons, including male investment and access to their offspring and the benefits children receive because of it. Society, in turn, is built on the family unit. Patriarchy allows women the freedom to focus on producing and caring for children, and this has and always will benefit a society. Men are more likely to invest in a society that gives them benefits and a direct role of power, as patriarchy does, than they are to invest in a society that marginalizes them and takes away their power. Think on the current Western and Western-only MGTOW phenomenon as evidence. Young men going their own way in their legion are dropping out of society. While there are many reasons for it, central is the rise of feminism and the disincentives that it presents to men. Also, a side note, the situation in Japan and its hikikomori is a very different situation that would require its own video, and that video is in the mail. So, while there is no universal system that has no faults, and yes, women, as stated, should have equality of opportunity, equality before the law, and equal human rights, 
It is a sad fact that sometimes the desires of the individual are not compatible with the needs of the many to have a stable functioning society in the long run. And yes, late stage capitalism and consumerism all play into low fertility rates, but again, those are topics for another video. All that is clear is that in the grander scheme of things, pro-natalism and patriarchy as a system of human organization works and feminism and antinatalism does not. Now, I'm not saying that a new kind of social organization cannot be found, but thus far, patriarchy seems to be the only one that is capable of creating high civilization. Perhaps a middle ground is needed. Some ideas I'll throw out is, of course, that women should continue to have the educational attainment that they already enjoy and stress on women having a choice in the direction her life takes. But perhaps social shifts that celebrate motherhood, especially in the most fertile years of a woman's life cycle, while discouraging the now celebrated extreme promiscuity exemplified by farcical protest movements like slut walks. Also, the ability of women to reintegrate into the workforce in her post-child-rearing years with ease, while the imbalances in family law being placed on a more even keel, as well as the elimination of government support and handouts for women that make poor choices with their lives, as well as ending abortion as a tool of further reckless sexual behavior or as a family planning option, and only to be used in the most extreme cases of rape, incest, or when danger is imminent to the mother's life. I'm only spitballing here. Please feel free to add your own ideas in the comment section below. Because either way, the extreme antenatal experiment currently underway in the West, which is only a few decades old, will not last forever. Perhaps another half century at most, and a patriarchal order will return one way or another. The problem for our daughters and granddaughters is they might not face the benign pre-1970s Western character of patriarchy, but something altogether different that is more extreme, more restrictive, and profoundly more misogynistic. Only time will tell. Tick tock, tick tock. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing. Also, please consider visiting my sponsor, Vikings. Links are in the description and try out the game. I liked it and I have a feeling you will too. Till next time.